Good morning, all. Um, after a spectacular night, thank you, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm going to be asking some questions, as usual. And we will go to the audience um, a little bit later. So uh, get your questions. Um, Warren, I am, I'm going to start unusually with uh, current events. Because last week, you announced that you were buying the fifth largest auto, insur uh, auto, auto, insurance, mm -hmm. uh, auto dealership in the country, Van right. Tile Group of Phoenix. Now, there may even be some people in the audience who think of the car business as ethically channel, challenged. But um, at any rate, what I'd like you to do is spend a, um, a, a paragraph or two talking about what, by Buffett's standards, is a good business, and then go into why does the car dealership business look like a good business to you? A, a good business is the one that earns a high rate of return on on tangible assets. <laughs> very simple. <laughs> That's pretty simple, yeah. And, and uh, uh, the very best businesses are the ones that earn a high rate of return on tangible assets and, and grow. But uh, uh, even ones that don't grow, uh, if they earn a high return on tangible assets, and then of course if you don't pay too much, uh, uh, they can be a good investment. They're a good business to start with by the high returns. If you pay too much for them, you can turn a a good business into a bad investment, but if you pay an appropriate price, uh, you can uh, you can do all right. Now, the, the big mistake which we made in the early years was to try and buy a bad business at a really cheap price, and uh, it took me about 20 or 30 years to figure out that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> but this is a, the car business, the car dealership business, if run well, uh, can be a very good business. You, you have no receivables to speak of. Uh, you floor plan your inventory, uh, you can, you can lease your uh, real estate. We don't do that. We'll own 95% of our real estate. So you can have very little capital actually invested in the business. And you do a, you do a large volume. Uh, Van Tile, which we bought, uh, has 78 dealerships. Uh, they'll average over $100, $100 million a dealership. So you can work on fairly narrow margins and still earn a high return on capital if you don't tie up much capital into a hundred million of business. And how many car dealerships are there in total in the United States? Well, there are over 17,000 car dealerships in the United States. And the interesting thing is if you go back 40 or 50 years, there were uh, in the 30,000. So while the country has grown dramatically, and actually the number of, uh, number of nameplates in the, uh, in, the, in the car business have grown, uh, you've cut the dealerships almost in half. Uh, so the average dealer now does far, far greater volume than when I was growing up. Well, by all means, visit a Berkshire Hathaway uh, car dealership in the next year and report back. Yeah. Now, um, Ed, let's talk about, let's go from that to some entirely different industry, the big banks of the United States. Right. Uh, and the question of whether they are good businesses and the question of what's happened to that in the last few years. Are they as good a business as they were a few years ago? No, no. The uh, banks earn on assets. They don't earn on net worth. Uh, you know, you, you calculate it eventually as to what they earn on equity or net worth, but they, uh, the assets are the earning factors, and they've changed the rules so that you have to have more net worth per, per dollar of assets, and obviously if you have more net worth per dollar of assets and you're earning a constant amount on assets, your earnings on net worth go down. Now, they, they were ungodly profitable, oh, the, the better ones were, uh, back 15 years ago uh, or 10 years ago even, uh, when they had high ratios of assets uh, to uh, net worth, and some of them even cheated in terms of having even more assets than the regulators would have allowed, and you had uh, you had these sieves, as they were called. Citigroup had a whole bunch of them, uh, uh, so they were off balance sheet ways of even uh, controlling more assets. But all of that sort of thing has been terminated, and now now they're uh, they've got much lower limits as to the assets to uh, net worth ratios, and the bigger the bank to some extent, the bigger the bank, the lower that ratio can be. So what was a very profitable business has been turned into a good business if executed well. Uh, it's a pretty simple business. I mean, if, uh, you know, you get your money cheap, very cheap. Uh, Wells Fargo will have a, a trillion dollars, roughly, or close to that of, of depositors' money, and it's, it's probably costing around 10 basis points. Now, most people think you get a trillion dollars of money and pay a tenth of one percent for it uh, would find some way to do something profitable. The, uh, 
But the, the banks have always gotten in trouble on the asset side. They've never gotten in trouble on the liability side, basically. But they, and they really haven't gotten in trouble too much on the expense side. But they go crazy occasionally on the asset side. And what they do is they start copying what their dumb competitors are doing. That's, that's, that happens in every business, but it's particularly uh, virulent in the uh, banking business. Uh, uh, John Stump once said, he said, I don't know why we keep looking for new ways to lose money when the old ones were working so well. But, uh, uh, but they do, and they, and they copycat. That, that's a great danger in any business. I, I warn our managers against it all the time. If anybody comes to me and says, we want to do this because the other guy is doing it, you know, I say go back to square one and come up with a better reason. But human nature is such that you do want to do what others are doing. I one time was at a director's meeting where a leading property casualty insurance uh, manager, a very well-known guy, was uh, making a presentation to buy a life insurance company. He was going through all these kind of silly reasons why they should do it. And he realized that the crowd was kind of catching on to the fact these reasons were too good. So finally, he just threw up his hands and say, said, oh, all the other kids have one. <laughs> and basically, there's, there's a lot of business decisions made because all the other kids have one. <laughs> OK, now let's move to the stock market, a okay. subject of a great interest to everyone here, I'm sure. Um, you, over the years, you've generally been reluctant to, um, to frame a big cosmic qu um, position yeah. on the stock market. I've done it about five times. I know. But I think last spring, if I'm remembering correctly, and correct me if I'm not, you said that stocks were neither greatly expensive or really cheap. Right. What would you say now about stocks? And in, in answer, you might also mention uh, what people are now calling the Buffett standard. I didn't even know that. A, st a statistical comparison that Fortune has used and promoted over the years. And tell us how things rank there. Well, I did, I did use in a talk I gave 15 years ago at Sun Valley and got reprinted in Fortune um, a standard of total market uh, capitalization uh, uh, to GDP, and, and that I used that because it showed at that time how extreme things had gotten. I think they'd gone from Pretty like, high. yeah, they, they'd gotten to, from 40% of GDP, which had been kind of standard over the years, they'd gotten up to like 170 or percent or something. So it wasn't designed to be a fine-tuning type of valuation, but it, it, it showed things that really changed in a big way. A very high percentage of the time, stocks are in what I call a zone of reasonableness. Now, this is not something, you know, we all know that pi is 3.14159, and, and little kids can sometimes give it out to hundreds of, <laughs> of uh, decimal places. But the stock market's not like that. There, there's a range of reasonableness. And most of the time throughout my lifetime, it's sold in the range of reasonableness. That range changes over time as, as earnings accumulate, interest rates change, and all that sort of thing. There's only been about five times in my life, I think, I've actually spoken out publicly to say it was outside the range in one direction or another. The most recent one being in October, I was early in October of 2008, and I said stocks were cheap, and I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. But I'll probably have something, some chance, you know, once every five or 10 years to make a definitive statement. There is a big zone of reasonableness. Anybody thinks they can pinpoint it is crazy. You know, it's, just, it's not that precise. Uh, and fortunately, you don't need to. You know, if you, if you buy good businesses at reasonable prices and hold them, you're going to make a lot of money. And, and uh, that's true of stocks as a group. It's true of individual companies. So you're saying that right now they are in a zone of reasonableness. They are in a zone of reasonableness. And, okay. Yep. Okay. All right. We're going to move sharply um, uh, to another direction, to politics. Um, a, a question of very great interest to this audience. Is Hillary going to run? Now, let me give you a background on Hillary because... In 2008, Warren promised support to both Hillary and Barack Obama. Yep. And then when he found out that he'd done that sort of, he said, well, OK, I'll just be a bigamist. So he, he, did, um, he did back both The only of time I've been a bigamist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so, OK, tell us, is Hillary going to run? Hillary's going to run. Hillary's going to run. Yep. How soon is she going to announce it? Uh, she's going to announce it uh, as late as possible. Uh -huh. Well, how late is late? Is no, no, well, that, that, uh, I'm giving a direct quote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Next question. Who's going to be your opponent? Who would you get? I, I don't know. I, it, it, the interesting thing is that Mitt Romney's getting more interested. Right. Yeah, right. But it, 
her opponent will be whoever wins the Republican primary, and there's going to be a lot of people who want to do it. Well, some people say that if Jeb Bush runs, uh, that um, Mitt Romney won't. Do you, do you believe that's the case? I think, I think when, once they have the political bug, anybody will run that they think can get a, has a chance mm -hmm. and who thinks they can raise the money. Okay. That's now, called the Buffett's Law. <laughs> <laughs> now, final question on that. Um, is Hillary going to win? Hillary's going to win. Yeah. Well, I, I know... Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I've heard it just in the last few days that some of the political pundits like Ed Rollins are saying that, that it really, that it is going to be true. I right? will bet money on it. I mean, you, yeah, you yeah, will yeah. bet money. I don't do that easily. Anybody <laughs> in the audience who would like to uh, 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 come on the other side of Warren Buffett, I want to tell you it's not too good a deal being on the other side of Warren Buffett. <laughs> we, we did that on silver one time. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, um, I was um, uh, selling short and you were buying right. on, on silver. That was right. Okay. Now, <laughs> A business issue that is constantly in the press is the security of corporate data. Uh, has Berkshire had, or have you had personally, um, any security problems? I don't have anything to hack. I'm, I'm, the, only, uh, I'm the only person without any, uh, any email. So that, uh, and I'm groping here to pull out my, this is, this is the latest I've gotten in technology. This is my little, <laughs> it's, um, uh, uh, I, I, I really feel kind of with it, carrying that around. I don't know how to use it, understand, but, but I like to pull it out on occasion just to impress people. Uh, and, and wasn't there an occasion where you didn't look at it for kind of a year? Well, there was a famous case where during the Lehman weekend, I received a call on Saturday night. I was in Edmonton, Cal uh, Edmonton Alberta, very late at night. And uh, well, I uh, first arrived there for a social event at six o'clock, and I got a call from Bob Diamond of Lehman, or Bob Diamond of Barclays, who was trying to buy Lehman, and they wanted the, the British government had just told Lehman, or told Barclays, I'm sorry, they told Barclays they could not buy Lehman uh, and expose themselves to a, a loss of greater than three three billion pounds without getting shareholder approval, and they and they would need at least a month to get shareholder approval, so. Bob Diamond said to me, uh, what would you charge to ensure uh, all the parties doing business with us that their contracts would be fulfilled between uh, when we make the deal and when we have a chance to have a shareholder's vote approving it, which would have been at least 30 days, probably 60 days. And I said, well, I've never heard of a contract like this, and how much do you want the indemnity before he said, "I want it to be unlimited." <laughs> well, unlimited was not a great word in the fall of 2008. Uh, so I said, "I'm going to this party. I'll, I'll come back about midnight. Fax me how much you'll pay. I'll be able to find the terms of the contract. But tell me how much you'll pay, and I will get back to you no matter what hour it is. It was a couple hours later in New York, and uh, and I'll let you know whether I'll do it." So I went to the party, and I came back at midnight, and there was no fax. And I went down to the de desk and I said, where's the fax? And they said, we don't have a fax. And I, so I stayed up for another hour or two. Finally, I gave up. Uh, that was September 2008. In July of 2009, I was going to Sun Valley. And we got off the plane and I opened this very modern uh, contraption I have in my pocket. And it said message waiting or something like that. And I, I don't know how to work that part of it. So I, I, gave, it, I gave it to my daughter, who's here. And I said, tell me what this is messages on here and uh, so she uh, pulled it up and handed it to me and I started listening and and uh, she started talking to me I said quiet I'm trying to listen to this and uh, it turned out that it was a message from that night in September <laughs> telling me that they would call me on Sunday and we'd try to work out all this thing so if you really want to know the story of why Lehman failed <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there... Send smoke signals to me if you have anything important to say. <laughs> so, so uh, you haven't had any security problems. I don't think Berkshire has got, had any security problems. No. How about, didn't your wife lose her credit card once? Your first wife lose her credit card once? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> when my first wife lost her credit card, I made no attempt to get it back because the guy was spending less than she was. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so, um, okay, now a new, uh, one other current event issue, um, a fascinating, fascinating trial is going on in Washington right. in which AIG's former CEO, Hank Greenberg, 
is contending that Washington's regulators not only acted wrongly in 2008 in taking over AEIG, that was right after Lehman, the, the next day of, the, of that, right after Lehman failed, but also wrongfully imposed onerous conditions on AIG, charging it high, sky high interest rates, for example. What's your opinion about the issues in that trial? Well, I know certain aspects of it, I don't uh -huh. know others. Uh, no. uh, we had been <clears throat> looking at AIG over that same weekend when I was up at Edmonds, right. I, I came back. And AIG had first engaged us, well, they tried to engage us numerous times, but they first engaged us on Friday, preceding my going to Canada for that social affair. And uh, uh, on Friday, I went down to the office on Friday night, and they, they faxed me a whole bunch of material on the property casualty operations of AIG. They also had a lot of life operations, and unfortunately, <laughs> they had AIG financial products, which had a whole lot of derivative operations. That was at the parent, up toward the parent company. And I had to know whether the property casualty company had been contaminated by any cross guarantees between they and AIG financial products, and they assured me they hadn't. So I went down to the office, <clears throat> and they sent me all this material. <clears throat> and I looked at it for about an hour, and then I called Bob Willemstead, and I said, look at don't waste your time on me because there is no way uh, that I can come up with a number that will make any be of any help to you. And besides, I can't make I, I, I wouldn't be sure of that number even because it's such a mess of spaghetti, basically. And uh, and don't you know you've got to you've got to come up with a solution by early next week. So spend your time on somebody else. But nevertheless, they kept pulling in another fellow, a Jeet Chain, and on Sunday he was working on everything. So we had some vague picture of it. And then I got a call on either Monday or Tuesday from Tim Geithner, who I'd never met before, and Tim said that they were contemplating lending $85 billion, uh, uh, the Fed, New York Fed was, to, the, um, to AIG. And in my opinion, was there enough in the way of value there to warrant such an $85 billion, billion dollar loan? And I said, uh, nobody could know under the circumstances of that day, there wasn't anything that was worth $85 billion or anything like it. I mean, it was total chaos. But I thought that if they had staying power and if there weren't things there that I didn't know about, which there could be, uh, probably the underlying subsidiaries would bring $85 billion in a normalized market, and that was that. Uh, uh, I would say this, that it's been proven that in a stabilized situation where people were not worried about the survival of AIG because the government was behind it. Those subsidiaries have been proved to be worth a lot more than $85 billion. But I will also say, say this. If the New York Fed had not put the money in within 24 hours, it, it, unquestionably, AIG would have been walking over to a federal judge's uh, quarters uh, with a petition of bankruptcy. They, they, they were gone, and they did not. They had, they had a, they had a downgrade coming where they on on on, on their credit, where they would have had to put up more, way more collateral on a bunch of things they'd done in the financial product subsidiary. Uh, so they were they, they were totally gone. Now it's up to a judge to determine, you know, the propriety of all these things. But the one thing I'm, I'm clear on is that, that there would have been AIG would have been in bankruptcy absent the activities of the New York Fed. Uh, within 48 hours of when Geithner called me. I see. So that's that's a big central point. Well, it's a central point, but I, there's questions about the terms and all of that, mm -hmm. which are going mm -hmm. to be adjudicated, and uh, or being adjudicated right now. And uh, I, I I just don't know the law on that. Uh, but there was not an, there was no other option for AIG at that point, and there was nobody that would have lent them the money or invested on on terms that were twice as onerous, uh, onerous as the ones imposed by the New York Fed. It, uh, uh, it, it was, for those of you who may have missed the main show in 2008, it, 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 was, it was a period like we've never had in this country. And, and one of the things during a period like that, it really is like the fog of war. I mean, if you're Paulson or Bernanke, uh, you know, or Sheila Bear, uh, the, you're getting reports from all these different fronts. Some of them are somewhat inaccurate. You know, some of them have a bias to them based on what the parties want you to do. It is total mass confusion. And, and on the other hand, you have to navigate through it. And, and you have to navigate through it to some extent in cooperating with other people, particularly Congress. And, 
it was an ungodly, uh, 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 I've never seen anything like it. I don't think I'll ever see anything like it again. And, it, and, I, and I give great credit to Paulson and Bernanke and Geithner and Gilles Lebert for what, I give credit to President Bush for the way they handled it. You can criticize how, what might have been done leading up to it, but when Pearl Harbor happened, they did the right thing. And um, my final question here, um, uh, what about the political uh, deadlock in Washington? Do you see any hope? Do you see how we get out of that? Well, we'll get out of it somehow because uh -huh. we don't have a, we, uh, you know, I always say that buy stock in a business that's so good that an idiot can run it because sooner <laughs> or later one will. Uh, <laughs> now, if you want to, you can make a mental jump on that over to governments and so on. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we, we do have a country that works over time. I mean, it's an unbelievable country. Uh, and it, it will continue to, to work. It, it, will, it will get people, well, we had a civil war here in, the, you know, in, the, in this country. We have had all kinds of problems in the past. But this country, is, it's unbelievable what's happened since 1776, and the game isn't over. So I'm, I'm an optimist about it getting solved. Uh, but if you ask me how it's going to happen, I would say uh, I don't have the faintest it's idea. The, it's, it's, it's a terrible situation, you know, whether it's in a family, in a business, in a government, when a significant portion of the people involved don't even really want to succeed. They want the other person to fail. And uh, that's it. You never want to bring that, you know, into, into, into any activity. I mean, it, uh, but a significant percentage of people in Congress really want the president to fail. Yeah. And that is not good for the country. And, and uh, uh, we'll, get, we'll get past it one way or another. But, uh, but it has been, you know, it has been a pretty ugly show in, 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 in recent years. Uh, uh, but don't, don't ever, do, uh, that should not affect in any way your business decisions. Charlie Munger and I have been making stock decisions and business decisions uh, one way or another together now for 55 years. We have never let, well, the macro doesn't enter into it, nor does political. We, we, have, we have not made decisions differently because one party or the other's in power. We have not made decisions based on whether we thought interest rates were going to go up or down or, or you know, what was going to happen with labor negotiations someplace. You know, you don't want to give up what you know how to do because of opinions which you don't know whether they're right or not and which are going to be transitory in any event. So you really go out there every day and do whatever makes the most sense. So when we buy the auto dealerships last week, uh, we don't factor in anything about the Fed, about the deadlock in politics, about what's going on around the world. Those are all important things, but they don't affect whether those dealerships, which we're buying to own 100 years, they don't affect whether they're going to make money in the year 2024 or 2034 or 2044. And the, the important thing is whether we get a good business with good management at a sensible price. Yeah. Now, let me turn to the audience where it's always hard to see up here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you'll raise your hand, other people yes. will help me. Uh, anything uh, over here? Hi, Warren. It's Catherine Keating from JP Morgan. I want to ask you about uh, your view on the economy. You know, a lot of economists have claimed coming out of the crisis that we have a prolonged period of slower growth, and yet you're investing in car sales, home sales, trains, transportation, things deeply sensitive to the economy. I'd love to hear your view about well, where, where you see us today. Yeah. Since the fall of 2009, five years ago now, we have seen, both in our own businesses, and we've got 75 or more businesses. We've really got a lot more than that, but because some of them own other ones. But we have... We're across the board in everything. We're now in planes, trains, and automobiles, no. <laughs> among other things. They, but we're, we're, we're in all kinds of businesses, and they interact with all kinds of businesses. We have seen, since 2009, really a rather steady, not at the rate people hope, but a rather steady increase in business right straight through. We've heard talk, and you've heard talk during that period about double dips and all these things and acceleration and everything. We have not seen it accelerate much or decelerate much ever from, a, say, a 2% or thereabout uh, uh, rate. And that's what we see today. And we see it, whether it's in freight car loadings, we see it in all, all kinds of ways. Automobiles have been better than I would have anticipated. Housing has been worse than I would have anticipated. But overall, the economy has been moving forward now for 
five years. Now, it's moving from a position that, you know, they talk about having eight or nine recessions since World War II and how we've come out of them faster. This was way, way, way different than any other recession we've had post-World War II. This was a recession where virtually everybody in this room and around the country was actually scared for a while. I mean, people go through recessions and they're unpleasant and all that, but people literally, they took treasury bill rates down to a negative rate. Now, when you were willing to take less money from a treasury mill, bill than you would get from putting money under your mattress, you know, that is a different phenomenon in, in economics from what we've experienced. So, so you have had a, the American people be paralyzed by fear and coming out of that paralysis. And the gain has been really, I think, quite satisfactory. And, and you'd, you'd love to see it faster. And let me point out one other thing. We talk about 2% of your gains now, and everybody says that's terrible, you know, and it's not our potential and everything. The population is probably going to grow at a little less than 1% a year. So if you have 2% real gains, that means in a, in, in, in a generation, in 20 years, you will have greater than a 20% per capita gain in real GDP. Now, real GDP is about $54,000 per person in the United States. If you get a 20% real gain per capita, that's $10,000 per person more per capita income in the United States in one generation. That's fantastic. I mean, it, 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 it may not be as good as we did in some of the decades after World War II, but if you go back in history, centuries went by without, without getting anything like that. And, and 20% gain, how would you like to have that distributed somehow evenly across the population? You'd be rid of all poverty and everything else. So even at our present rates of gain, this country is turning out more and more stuff per capita uh, year by year, and it will continue to do so. We have a marvelous machine, and, and it, has, it has worked extraordinarily since 1776. In my lifetime, I was born in 1930, in my lifetime, the real GDP per capita in the United States has increased six for one, one person's lifetime. You know, I mean, it, it, nothing like it's ever happened. And, and, and it isn't because we're smarter, and it isn't because we work harder, it's because we have a system that unleashes human potential. And, you know, just look at the people in this room. I mean, you know, you, you have more potential than you thought you had 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You certainly have more potential than your parents thought you had. <laughs> 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 so it, it just, it, it just and, and you will find 10 years from now you have a, you, that you had a lot more potential than you thought you had today. I mean, this, and, and you're going to get a chance to use it in this country, you know, you're not condemned to a life that you know was was ordained by by what your parents did before you or something of the sort. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful system, and it's and it's still working, and it will keep working. Here. Hi, uh, Jenny Johnson with Franklin Templeton Investments. How do you know when to throw in the towel on an investment or a business? Uh, when you throw in the towel on an oh, investment or business. Or business? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, you, what you know is you do it too late. <laughs> I've done, I, I went in the textile business by accident in 1965, and I threw in the towel about 20 years later. And that was about 20 years too late. <laughs> the, there's a great tendency to want to uh, hold on, justify old decisions. I mean, that's a human, human trait. And uh, what when you really know you've got a bad business is when you have a good manager and you're getting bad results. I mean, it, it, when, you, when, you, when you're getting bad results with a bad manager, you still have to examine the question of whether, you know, you can get better results if you get a better manager. Usually you can't. You know, I've, I've said in the past, you know, that when a, when a management with a reputation for excellence encounters a business with a re reputation for bad economics, it's the reputation of the business that remains intact. And, <laughs> and I've proved that many times. <laughs> uh, uh, there are businesses that are just plain tough. You know, and there's the, there, there, they, there may be too many competitors, but there's reasons why they don't drop out. There's reasons. Well, we, we started out in textiles, and we made over half of the, uh, the linings for men's suits in the country. And we, we went through World War II and got awards, and, and Sears Roebuck named us there 
supplier of the year and all of that sort of thing. And uh, then we'd say, well, we'd like to increase the price of, of these linings a quarter of a cent a yard. And Sears would say, be out of your mind. There's 10 other guys that will sell them to us at the old price. And nobody ever went into a Sears store and said, I'd like a, a blue serge shirt a, a blue shirt, serge suit with a half of my lining. You know? <laughs> it, it didn't exist. We had no connection to the consumer. And there are lots of lousy businesses, you know, and there's lots of wonderful businesses. And oh, my job over the years has been to try and figure out which is which, and I've made plenty of mistakes. I bought a company called Dexter Shoes. In the early 90s, I paid 400 plus million dollars for it, and it, it made a lot of money before I bought it. But, you know, as soon as I bought it, they pulled some switch or something and it, it, it <laughs> immediately started losing money. And, uh, and it was because of foreign competition and so on, or it was, maybe it was because I owned it, I don't know. Uh, and it went to zero. And the worst thing was that I paid for it in stock. So that 400 million in stock I gave at the time is uh, now worth about 5 billion. So it, it uh, so, uh, Every time Berkshire stock goes down, I feel a little bit better because of my <laughs> opportunity lo loss on this business. But, you know, when I looked at Dexter's shoe, they had a good position in retailers. They turned out good shoes. They had a great workforce, all kinds of things. But I just forgot one thing, that, that they weren't going to make shoes in the United States anymore. Okay. <laughs> so you make, you, you make mistakes, and it does pay to recognize quickly when you've made them. If, you, if you've got a good person running a business and it isn't making any money, uh, you know, you're in the wrong business, and, and you've got to face up to that. And on her, I think the other half of the question was about investments. Do you have any rule of thumb about when you give up on or when you realize that? Well, again, I mean, I love it when the things we buy go down. I mean, uh, that, I mean, I just, I get euphoric, <laughs> you know. I, the stocks are down today, and I'm buying more of something I was buying yesterday. I'm buying it cheaper. Now, when you go to the grocery store and you buy something cheaper than you bought it the day before, you think that's terrific. But people with their stocks... They, they think that the stock knows more than they do. So that they, when the stock goes down, they say the stock is telling them something, you know. And, and it, what it's telling me is I can get more for my money. <laughs> but but they, uh, they take it as kind of a referendum on themselves, you know, and it's me versus the stock. If it ever gets back to what I paid, I'm gonna sell it. The stock doesn't care what you paid. I mean, I, you have to remember, the stock doesn't even care that you own it. You are nothing to the stock. <laughs> That's, that stock is everything to you, you know. And you remember you paid ten dollars and thirteen cents, and therefore the stock should get to ten thirteen before you sell it. You know, the stock has no feelings about you. you know? <laughs> it, it, I hate to disillusion you on this, but it, it just doesn't care. <laughs> and, and so the only question with every stock every day, and you don't do it this frequently, is can I get more for my money someplace else? You've got a chance to be in thousands and thousands of great businesses, and their prices change all the time, so their relative valuations change. And you can make the exchange at very low cost these days, commissions or nothing. And so you can always shift from one business to another. You have a huge advantage over Andrew Carnegie. You know, when he was in the steel business, he was in the steel business, or Rockefeller was in the oil business. He could not shift over immediately to retailing or something like that. You, you can rearrange your business empire, which you own through that little portfolio that you have, you can rearrange that you know, at a moment's notice with practically no cost. It's a huge advantage, which people turn into a disadvantage. Uh, there is nothing about the price action of the stock that tells you whether you should keep owning it. What tells you whether you should keep owning it is what you expect the company to do in the future versus the price at which it's selling now compared to the other opportunities of businesses that you think you know equally well and make that same comparison. And that's all there is to owning stocks. Um, question? Uh, oh, back there in the back, are there two hands up together? Yes. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you choose uh, back there. Hi. Um, you said obviously this recovery has been a little, you know, uh, bumpy, and some industries have done well, and some not so well, like home building. Uh, many have articulated that for us to really see the full potential of our economy growing, home building is going to have to recover. Do you agree with that? And what does that look like for you? And what do you think the catalyst is to get us there? Yeah. I didn't get it home building. Oh. Um, you said earlier that it had lagged, y and. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what do you think about home building and whether, how much of a problem is this? 
Well, it's come back some, but it's come back at a pace way less than I would expect. Now, we overbuilt like crazy in 2004, 5, and 6. We were building a couple million units. And basically, it ties in with household formation. <laughs> and household formation falls off dramatically in a recession, at least initially. I mean, uh, if you look at 2009, uh, uh, I believe the household formation you know, was almost flat. Uh, people just they, they put plans on hold. But that doesn't last long, you know. Hormones kick in, you know, and 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 in-laws get tiresome too. So, yeah, so in the end, you know, if if people keep behaving as they have since Adam and Eve, uh, you will have household formations in this country, and and you will have them, and you will not have them all, you know, wanting to live with their in-laws or some other. Place. They will want to have their own homes or apartment units. Now we've had more of a bulge in apartment units than we have at homes. I mean, there can be some movement between people's preferences uh, within whether they want to live in an owner-occupied home or, 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 or in an apartment. But so far in this recovery, and we're in the carpet business, we are the largest home builder in the United States. We own a company called Clayton Homes. It, it actually will turn out about 30,000 homes this year. Uh, but it's lagged significantly the rate of gain I would expect, considering everything else that's happened in the economy and considering how low interest rates are. I mean, uh, you know, everybody in this room should get a 30-year mortgage now, and you get the mortgage. If it turns out interest rates go lower, you call it off. If they go higher, you don't call it off. Yeah, you've got the option. It's an incredibly attractive instrument for the, you know, it's, it's a 30-minute instrument if you've been wrong on interest rates, and it's a 30-year instrument if you've been right on interest rates. And, and it's, it's, it, there, I can't get that one-sided an instrument at Berkshire Hathaway. I can only get it through a mortgage. So you would think that people would be lining up now to, to get mortgages to buy a home. And, and uh, it, it, it's a good way to go short the dollar. I mean, there's all, there's all uh, short interest rates. It's, 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 a, it's almost, a, it, it is a no-brainer, but so far, uh, you know, home construction pickup has been slower than I would anticipate. But I have a lot of faith in hormones, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, I don't really think that their impact will be less five or ten years from now. So we will have a catch-up period. We've had the catch-up period going on in autos uh, at a much faster pace, I think, than most people anticipated. I mean, we're going to have close to 17 million car year here, and I would not have guessed we'd have a 17 million car year at the same time that we'd have uh, houses moving at the rate they, they are. It'll, it'll, it'll improve, but I, I, I've been wrong on the timing so far, so I'll probably be, continue to be wrong. Well, I'm afraid that the clock is telling us that it's uh, our time's up, and I hope we'll give uh, Warren uh, a great hand for both speaking and singing to us. <laughs>